This is a film about the physically handicapped. A film about us. A group of people who, if society were honest with itself, would probably say more of an embarrassment than anything else. For we reflect a peculiar kind of hypocrisy. While everyone seems quite prepared to accept us when we are children, once we grow up, they seem totally unprepared to accept the possibility that we might have the same aspirations as everyone else. This film is about one of the most important of those aspirations, the right to work. Well, they've tried to get other work, other employment, but you can't get it. They just don't want to know. You just don't want to take you on. And the government to tell them they've got to take a certain percentage of disabled people throughout the country, but they don't, I don't know whether they can uh, uh, comply with it. I've been looking for years, ever since I've been the age of, you know, f uh, 15 years old. I tried to get a job everywhere. Before I went up to the Rampoy factory and I was a lady. Well, they just don't want to take you on. They just said there's nothing there suitable. I mean, there's bound to be a job somewhere they could do in one of the factories. I've always been, they've always been my ambition, in spite of my handicap, to come independent as much as I can, like, in spite of it, like. Because all the more reason why these people should help you when you're, gonna, when you're trying to help yourself. But instead of that, they make life more difficult, more harder. I mean, it's a long way to Abbas and Lady every day. To get up that time, I mean, I get tired when I get home. Makes it a long day. <coughs> when I get out of bed about four o'clock, I try to come downstairs about twenty past four. Look. I'm ready, you know, to follow, and then I do, by the time I come in here and lace my shoes up and go back out there, and then I have a shave and a wash and, and that, and get ready for work, get dressed. And then I have a cup of tea and that. It's time more or less to go. It takes me a long time. You need to leave about 7 o'clock to get up there between 7 and 10 past because it's a long way. You can't race in one of them, especially if the roads are bad. You've got a lorry overtaken, you want a bus overtaken, you want a coach or anything. Any high van, they, they'd blow them as they're overtaking them. They're only fiberglass, they are. Fiberglass body. There's no weight in them at all. And I'm heavy, but it still don't keep it down on the road. It's 26 miles a day, look, to have the lady then and back. In between life and death, travelling up there. Well, they make duffel bags, shopping bags, any, any type of bags they get, like, you know. They do a lot of army work there. You can see they do army work. Oh, it's good quality Rempoy work, eh? It's good work too, man. They really work really hard up there. That's a hard job, what I got turning them duffel bags. Employees wages is very poor. Very poor money. I think it's disgusting the money they get up there. My basic wages is 18 pounds, 12 pence. Well, uh, out of that, I mean, you've got your tax to pay for. So I pay about 2 pounds 25 a week. 
Well, then you've got your national insurance, graduated pension, all that. Well, I mean, by well, the time you come home, you only bring it home about £15, £16. Pounds. Have to run your own house, that's not a lot, see? So run home on these days. If I lose a day, like I lost Monday now, when I got in touch with the Social Security, I can't get it. They won't pay it. I just said, you've got, if you work three days or two days, you've got enough to live on. This is the attitude. I mean, if they'd encourage you more, if the government would help more in, in lots of ways and encourage you more, and say, well, all right, these cars breaking down, let's give them a, a proper car. We can't find them a job nearer. We'll give them a mini to get back and forth there. And when you're trying to help yourself like I am, it's all the more reason why they should help you. And the hidden sympathy you want when you've got a disability is practical help. You should never feel sorry for anybody with a disability. I don't want nobody to feel sorry for me. I mean, it's help I want. And the government ought to be held up in every way they can. If they had more factories and more sheltered workshops for disabled people and done more, it would make life a lot more easier. Instead of that, they make life harder. Everything is arranged against employing handicapped people. Nobody is really encouraged take them under their wing. But it's very difficult you know, to, dis to discuss something which is, uh, which one knows in your heart really that uh, people are really doing their best and won't do any better until they are forced to it. At the moment we think we are, we're, we're, because we offer them two hours a week or two hours uh, each morning a week and some local authorities are offering minimum, the minimum they can offer by law, they think they're doing that because they're doing their best, that's all that can be done. The fact is that we don't just don't scratch the surface. We certainly don't work any wonders here. But at least we offer a five-day week on a regular basis. And it isn't playing about either. We have production targets to meet, and all the work that leaves here has to be good, if anything, better than other subcontractors. Unfortunately, this place really is an exception to the rule. Most handicapped people really aren't given the opportunity to do anything constructive. I don't know if people appreciate how important it is to the two handicap work. There's lots of things we can do, rowboats, go sailing, fly an airplane. Um, these all these things are barred from the handicapped. And if you think of going home at night and just sitting down watching TV every night of the week, all the physical sports, you just can't be involved in. Work means a tremendous amount to you. And I sometimes think if anybody should be employed, it should be the handicapped. Because it literally is the best part of your life. You see, the fact is that almost all the people we have here simply wouldn't be offered anything else. I don't know if that chap in Wales knows how lucky he is, because Remploy aren't interested in heavily handicapped people. And for most of the people here, Remploy is out. They don't really want people that are handicapped. They'll take people that have fits, this, this type, but those people are 100%, 95% of the time, you can't really call them handicapped. They're handicapped whilst they're having a fit, they're handicapped them as far as they're barred from having a car. But when they're sitting down working, they're as good as your eye. And these are the people that are employ are employing. 
Rinpo is a great idea, but it's an idea that, to my mind, has certainly gone astray. Do go to Rinpo. Go to your local Rinpo. Walk around and see how many wheelchairs you can see. You see, Rinpo is set up. Uh, they decide their production, and then they take people to keep up the production. So, really, you ought to lower your production and take on more severely handicapped people. But this was the whole idea, the concept of Remploy, to employ these people coming back from the war that disabled. But now it has got completely disorientated. They pick and choose. You see me going through to them and I say, but you can't take him because he's handicapped. You'd think that industry would be the place that would provide most of the employment prospects for the handicapped. But there isn't any encouragement from the government for them to do much about it. Disablement resettlement officers are supposed to place handicapped people in open industry. But if the firm says it's impossible without workspace or machinery being adapted, what can he say? The money for these kinds of adaptations has got to come from somewhere. In our society, firms are out to make a profit. Therefore, there's no incentive at all for them to subsidise, which should be a function of society through the government. You look round your own office or factory, how many disabled people do you see? I'm one of the few lucky ones, at least I got a job in the outside world. How are you getting on with that letter, John? Well, too bad, actually. I'm not quite sure whether I should have that item as well. Yeah. On this list or on the other one. Check the service number. Go down to the um, files down at the end and check the cargo manifest. And if it's on there, but we haven't, but you can't find it on our bills anywhere, then you'll know that we've got a, a document missing and you'll have to chase for it. The first few years at work, you know, it was um, a growing up process as far as I was concerned, because I think when I left school, uh, I think that, um, being at a special school with so few contacts with outside people, you, you're about two or three years behind in maturity as far as anybody else is concerned. And yet at the same time, I was a sort of prisoner on two fronts, one mobility and, and two ignorance of what possibilities were. And I think that the ignorance of the alternatives was, you know, caused by the immaturity. I was also at this time using my own transport to and from work, which was an electric invalid carriage, which is a sort of the mo almost one of the most ghastly machines invented on the one hand because of the fact that it isolates people so much. Anyway, after a couple of years of saving up, I managed to change that and bought an automatic Mini. This meant basically that I was able to extricate myself from the incredibly tight reign of existence that I'd been living, you know, not going out at all in the evenings, but principally because the bloody electric invalid carriage needed recharging every night after the journey to and from work. I think it's something to remember that it was only because I was in an open employment earning the kind of money that made it possible for me to buy a car. God knows what would have happened if I hadn't have been able to afford the Mini. I think I would certainly have found myself at home every night of the week watching television perhaps. Probably someone would have found me something useful to do, like making a mosaic tile ashtray or weaving a scarf during the summer, or something very useful like that. Perhaps basket weaving, I gather, is very popular for handicapped people. That could have been my future if I'd been stuck with that bloody invalid carriage, frankly. people are encouraged to integrate, then they find their way out, which has happened to me, basically, I suppose. Two things. One, the influence of employment and meeting, you know, inverted commas, normal people at work, and two, becoming far more mobile by my own car, which has allowed me to develop more social contacts. But I think that there are a lot of people in day centres who shouldn't be there, and who wouldn't be there if they'd had the right opportunities at the right time and had been given the right background. I think that they've just been swept away 
and I, and I don't think you can blame the employers because there's no incentive really for them to take on disabled people unless, you know, they can obviously do a job as well as anybody else and they're not going to pose any particular problems. You know, if there's no problem for getting a wheelchair in, if there's no problem as far as walking about, and indeed if to all intents and purposes they're just going to behave normally. And it's quite obviously true, isn't going to be true of, of every disabled people. Of all disabled people there are going to be problems like toilets, for instance, if you're in a wheelchair. In fact, where I work, it's quite good really, there are uh, four toilets provided specifically in each corner of the building for disabled people. They're wider and the doors open outwards and then, you know, this is obviously a great help. And this is the kind of thing that's really needed, a sort of investment in it at the right time because it's cheaper then than to muck about and do it later. But because there aren't many of them and because they're not articulate and because they're not militant, because they're used to having stuff doled out to them and they don't create a fuss, then they're not a problem. And the fact remains that whatever our society provides by way of bricks and mortar, people who are handicapped are often very isolated. And perhaps more importantly, because they never meet society, they feel written off. Yet everybody seems to go on about pensioning us off, and cooping us up in hostels, and, and working in special centres, driving special cars, and, as a sort of solution to our problem. You know, a place in life for us. But, um, you know, there seems to be this incredible assumption that we would be somehow better off lumped together for the rest of our lives. The future becomes a fantasy because, in fact, that there's so little that's practically offered that you just begin to dream and everything becomes unrealistic. And likewise, the problems become unrealistic because they're not faced practically, they just push behind. So we tend to bury ourselves in books, learning about a world that unless things change, we'll probably never be a part of. Yet yeah, here we are, perfectly able to use our brains, trained and tutored, and what's it all for? What's at the end of it once he's got his degree? Basket weaving? Dick is one of the only two people here who's benefited from the kind of technology that our society is capable of devising when it tries. Opposite my window, there's one of those charity begging bowls, a little girl with calipers on her legs. 
I often wonder if we're not somehow condemned by that image. The trouble for society is that handicapped people grow up, grow up with the same desires and aspirations as everyone else. And beneath our, probably to you, alarming exteriors, we aren't very different. But have you ever seen a Charities Appeals poster with a handicapped adult on the front of it? You learn very slowly, not only your own limitations, but society's and its capacity to absorb you. In fact, you learn more quickly to be objective about society than you do about yourself. I accept, or more to the point, I put up with what you think when I'm walking down the street. I have no choice, but I can't really go about with a placard on my back saying, don't be embarrassed, I'm a person. You can spoon feed a handicapped child and teach it to walk, yes, but spoon feed a computer programmer It's, it's as if, as we grow up, the contradictions become too great for society to cope with. This image, or this one, somehow don't fit society's concept of what handicapped people ought to be doing. It often seems that we are still seen as objects that need to be occupied, and not as people who might just possibly want to do a job of work which has some dignity and purpose. We can't be beyond the capacity to of society to absorb us. I'm sure there must be countless firms and processes and means by which with a little bit of imagination on the part of the employer and will, we can be absorbed into the mainstream of life. But somehow these, this argument, or these arguments seem irrelevant to the uh, handicapped because without the desire of society to make a real effort to accept us as normal fellow human beings and not merely as an embarrassment, any progress seems doomed. If you can't guarantee acceptance by society, at least society should start to formulate a really imaginative policy to help the handicapped towards the first rung of social acceptance, a job in the outside world. Incentives must be created for, for industry to employ the handicapped because at present it's not only social stigma that denies the handicapped the possibility of employment, but simple things like a ramp here or a handrail there. And unless employers make the effort to create an environment in which people of varying ability can function at their maximum level, the handicapped won't get a look in. And it isn't simply a question of creating an environment solely for the handicapped. Thousands of people every year, either through age, accident or illness, suffer impairments which affect their ability to work. Do they have to be chucked on the junk heap too, simply because some employer is too short-sighted to spend a little money and put people first?